we'll be talking about communication and leadership in terms of farm management and employee management. So I'm Nathan Holinsky. I'm with the University of Minnesota Extension. That's who's putting this meeting on here today. I am out of the St. Cloud Regional Office. We have been working from home through this COVID pandemic, and I am currently in my office, or excuse me, in my home office, not the extension office. So thanks for joining us here. And I'll have Amber, who is my coworker, introduce herself as well. Hi folks, I am Amber Roberts and I also work with our agribusiness management team. I'm really excited in this series to get to talk with you about how to become a better supervisor and whether you're managing 100 employees or whether it is a close held family operation, we can always uh, strive to learn new skills to help improve being a supervisor. And this session is really exciting because we're talking about communication and leadership. And I help out with our farm transition team and boy, oh boy, is communication a tough thing for our families when they're thinking about transitioning it to the next generation. So really excited about that. Just to stress what Nathan said, if you have questions, I'll be monitoring the chat. You're also welcome to unmute. We encourage conversation. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Nathan. And we are going to start talking about communication. So what all goes into communication? Communication is a pretty broad term. We're probably going to think about speaking, right? Talking to your family, talking to your employees. You can see in this little word cloud we have on the screen, there's a lot of other words that go into that. You know, we have obviously language, written, and also we have poor, as in, you know, poor communication. We have nonverbal communication. And we'll be talking about these different forms of communication, the lack of communication, and how to better come across so people understand you. Different people might understand the same sentence you're saying differently based on both context, based on you know where they're coming from, where you're coming from. So we just want to highlight that effective communication is the groundwork for having proper leadership and employee management. If you can't communicate effectively with your employees and tell them what you expect of them, tell them what they should be doing on a day-to-day -day basis, how do you ever expect them to do so? Again, this effective communication is huge when it comes to employees. So this first little question we'll have here is, what does this slide say? Right? We can see that it's kind of a jumble of letters, but, but, what, but what do you read here? If we can have maybe someone, okay, there's, you can say, I am nowhere, right? But do you also see, I am now here, right? It's the same exact wording, but there's two different meanings from the same jumbled sentence. So I am nowhere and I am now here, again, kind of mean opposite things, and it's the same letters. So it's just kind of a silly example of how our communication is important and effective communication is very much different from communication in general. So again, just kind of a silly, silly thing to get us started off here. All right, skills to become a better listener. We'll go through some statistics in a little bit, but there's two parts of communication. There's both me talking to you, and then there's me listening as you talk. That's kind of the two sides of the communication story. And we want to highlight right now how to become a better listener. So some of the keys we have here are pausing one to two seconds before replying. Let's just say that me and you are having a, a conversation about what you expect me to do on the farm. Let's just say it's a dairy farm and you're trying to show me how to properly take care of the young stock, you know, how to, how to feed these little calves. If you are telling me something and there's one thing that I don't quite understand, be it be, you know, how old do we start weaning them off bottled milk versus feeding them through a pail, 
pausing this one to two seconds before replying is important. Instead of me just jumping in and say, oh, I have a question, blurting out these terms can kind of get confusing. A couple of reasons here. It shows that you are carefully listening. It also heavily increases the chances of avoiding interruption. If you jump in there right away and say, yo, I have a question, blah, 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 you might be talking over them and the chances of interruptions, which are very much a barrier to effective communication. Also, you can hear the other person better. If you're listening and pausing this one to two seconds to say, this is what I have a question of. I want you to clarify this next step. I want you to show me exactly what you're trying to say through a demonstration on how to, again, feed the calf or whatever this communication is. But this pausing the one to two seconds is an important step. And I want you to practice this pausing next time you're having a conversation with your family, your, your coworkers, your employees, whatever the case is. And my next point here is asking, tell me more. Show that you're interested, show that you're comprehending what they're saying and paying attention, but say, tell me more, expand on this. I don't just say yes, no, all right, I get it. Explaining, tell me more, show me more about this, this case that you're discussing. So hopefully this makes some sense. If we were doing this in person, we have a very fun, if that's the right term, we have a communication exercise where we have people paying attention when they're talking and then have the one person blatantly not paying attention when you're talking, just to show how, if you don't show how much you are paying attention, that you're really focusing in on the speaker, the conversation dies quickly. So again, pausing the one to two seconds is important before your response, then asking, tell me more, expand upon that are the two big takeaways. Again, tell me more is the thing we are trying to highlight. So here's just some numbers that are done through some university study. We can speak about 150 words per minute, but we can hear a thousand words per minute. So you can see that huge difference in how much we can understand versus how much we can speak to someone else. We have some summaries here on this active listening. Summarize to confirm. So again, kind of repeat what they're saying. Reiterate to remember. Again, this repetition is important for both remembering and confirming that the other individual heard or you were hearing what they were saying. Investigating for information and explain for understanding. This importance of the two-way communication is another takeaway from this first message that we have. This active listening is going to focus both on the message, the words we're trying to get across, and then also these underlying feelings. It requires the listening for both content and emotions. Because again, they are different ways to communicate with the nonverbal communication cues, providing that feedback. And we can see that as a result of that, we're going to have a lot more open communication, growth in people, and they're going to respect each other more. So if you show this active listening to your employees, they're more likely to listen to you. And this growth in people and communication, be more comfortable coming to you for questions in the future. If you come across as kind of tough to talk with, they'll find ways to not talk with you. They'll avoid you because they're not comfortable having conversation with you. So this active listening can resolve that issue. More in general, why does communication matter? We can see, again, this is a study by the United States Air Force that 70% of the time that we're awake is spent in some form of communication. We can see that 10% of your time is, is writing things down. We're reading, reading news, reading on your phone, whatever it is, we're reading things 15% of the time. We're talking 30% of the time, and then listening 45% of the time. So this 
communication in general is part of our lifestyle. We spend a lot of time both talking and listening to others, be it be the radio, be it be your coworkers, your employees, your bosses, whatever it is. Again, a lot of the time we're either talking or listening to someone else. So effective communication will impact most of your time and every aspect of your life here. So again, it's not only what you say, but how you say it. This is done from the UCLA. 93% of communication is nonverbal. So that's a huge percentage. I mean, the vast majority, right? Over 90% of what your form of communication comes from not just the word. You have that, you know, quick breakdown. 7% comes from the actual words that you're saying. There's a, a comment about body language in there, and that's exactly what we're talking about here, right? 55% of your communication effectiveness is coming from body movements, body language, facial structure. Are you smiling when you say it? Are you frowning when you say it? And then the other 38% of that comes from your voice tonage. So are you screaming at them? You know, the, the term of sarcasm, that comes a lot from the tone of voice. So how you're saying things, the, the pauses in your sentence structure, again, the voice tone, how loud are you speaking? Are you screaming? Are you whispering? Things like that. But the point of this slide is be cognizant of how you're speaking to others. Are you kind of condescending in your tone? And maybe you don't intend to be, but that's how you come across. So we just want to be cognizant of how others are interpreting how your communication is coming across. All right, so again, good communication is open and honest. Communication needs to be a two-way street. We want people comfortable in both starting part of the conversation and listening to you as well. Everyone involved must be willing to start the discussion. All parties must be included for the communication to be effective. Leave no one out of the conversation that's relevant to this conversation. Maybe it's only you and one employee that needs to hear this. If it's a new policy or something new happened on the farm, maybe your entire employee team should be in there. Have everybody welcome, have everybody feel comfortable answering, asking questions, updating your uh, policy or whatever this new structure is. But again, making people welcome or feel welcome in the conversation is an important way to gain trust and um, effective that they will listen to you and actually comprehend it. We're reiterating ourselves a little bit here, but good communication is going to improve relationships. You're going to receive more feedback and ideas. Maybe you have this one, one employee, they're a pretty good employee, they're just really quiet. But if you can get them to open up a little bit more, maybe that employee has a bunch of new ideas. Maybe they have some good feedback for how to improve one area of your farming operation. Or maybe they have feedback about another employee. If they're not comfortable, you know, talking to you in an open communication, you're not going to get that feedback. But again, if they're comfortable talking with you, you may be able to learn some new things. Again, you can identify some wants and needs. Maybe you didn't know that your one employee, you know, really wants to do more field work instead of only milk cows. They would like to expand into the other side of the farm. You had no idea that that was what they wanted. But with this open communication, we can fix that. Minimize these unmet expectations. Have the employees tell you what they expect from the farm. What do they expect through this career path that they're on? Maybe they're a college student. They expect to milk cows for the next four years. Once they're done with college, they're going to move on. And this isn't a long-term career path. That's good for both sides to understand that. Maybe they expect to become a herd manager in five years. You, as their boss, would probably like to know that then enhance this conflict resolution. So fights, conflict is just gonna be what are you disagreeing with on your employee? 
you maybe they did something wrong and you're you know yelling at them about it and trying to get them hey next time you need to do this through this open communication and strong communication we can resolve some of those conflicts before they even arise because they better understand what is expected of them so again we want to focus fully on the speaker one in to be an effective communicator not staring at your watch not looking at you know your phone not looking at the, the clock on the wall showing that you're ready for this conversation to be done avoid interruptions stay focused again showing interest in what's being said and, and acting like you're paying attention try to set judgment aside you don't have to agree with the person speaking but set aside your judgment with hold blame and criticism you're trying to understand their viewpoint effective communicators treat others well you're going to be building mutual trust have respect for everyone's view have respect for viewpoints listen with sincerity and keep an open mind obviously people have different ideas and we have this ever politicized world and you have people not agreeing with one another and maybe they're having some politics discussion on the farm you don't agree with them okay keep an open mind maybe they're not trying to change your viewpoint they're just strictly trying to show what their viewpoint is have respect for their viewpoint act with integrity do well for everyone okay so i'm just looking at the chat box again here So the questions come across, you know, text messages with employees, you know, the non-verbal communication. And, you know, that's part of our our next step here is different way people like to receive communication. So, right, there's different communication styles and text messages, right? I I text quite a bit. There is it's, you know, becoming very popular, you know, over the last, you know, 10 years ago it wasn't near as popular. So the point is how do we get through that communication and still be effective because a lot of these things that we just discussed aren't prevalent right you don't have the body language coming through that and i think my best feedback here to this question is again act sincere with your text messages i'm a big proponent of not the the shorthand but full sentences and i think when they knew who the text message is coming from they can read it with you in mind saying oh this is coming from the boss right and they can visualize you saying this to them so with your sincere communication when you are in person helps build how they understand how to read a text message because if i text amber one thing and some other you know individual on this call being that i know amber a whole lot better she probably understand it differently than to a stranger so knowing who it comes from and how they normally typically act through communication is is a big helpful starting point and again i think just with you know the cell phones the the text this distant communication it just goes along with that same point of acting sincerely through those messages hopefully that kind of helps i know that's kind of a tough one um, the other thing I'll add to that Nathan is you can set those expectations beforehand. So you can communicate with your employees even let's say it's a farm family business and you want to make sure that you are separating personal versus work. You can communicate that. So you can say, "Hey, I have a specific email that I've set up and this is where we're going to talk about work things." or if you want to put boundaries you can say for cell phones only during certain times or this is when it's appropriate to text and then I'll text you versus this matter might determine or need a phone call so sometimes setting those boundaries before you get started with that communication can help we also have here two questions Nathan I'll let you hop in I use emojis to soften communication that's great. A lot of us that are younger like to use emojis as well. Uh, big caution there. Just make sure that you know what those emojis mean. Some of them can have double meanings. 
that may not be transparent when you first use them, but just, just be careful on that front because younger generations use different emojis to mean different things. Uh, and what happens when family members do not respect those boundaries? Nathan, I'll have you help me tag in on this one. That's a little bit harder when family members choose not to respect the boundaries that we've set. No, it is difficult when people don't respect the boundaries that you set up. And when it's a family, you know, family run farms are very common. That throws another wrench in things because they're still your family at the end of the day. And you can't just, you know, what's the term? There's more of a connection there, right? You can't yell at your niece or nephew as you would a, a random employee and fire them for chance, right? It's a lot more difficult to discipline some of these family members when at the end of the day, you eat the same meal with them, right? So I think the best way that when family members aren't respecting these boundaries is to make sure that you stay within those boundaries, set a good example, and keep reminding them, hey, if it's something important, give me a phone call. Or, you know, as Amber iterated, we're going to have a work email to discuss work things, right? If we want to talk family gossip, we're not doing this, you know, on the clock or, or given that certain email chain or whatever the form of communication is. But, you know, maybe they're bringing up some random, you know, family drama that's irrelevant to the workplace saying, hey, let's talk about this later. But setting these, keep explaining what the boundaries are would be my best uh, strategy moving forward on how to resolve that. So hopefully we answered some of those questions. With that, I will keep moving forward here in our PowerPoint. And the next thing we have is this communication self-assessment exercise. So Amber sent this out to everybody in the group. It should have been in that email. She just threw it into a, a link on the chat box. And we have a, a website set up with this information saved in it. So you have access to this self-assessment. If you did it already, great. If you haven't done it yet, I recommend you to, to go through it. I did this again last night. It really only takes about 10 minutes. It's pretty quick. And we'll just explain it briefly and go through the meaning of that in the next few minutes. So again, for those of you who have taken it, this is what the, the, the start of it looks like. There's 40 pairs of sentences and you select which one is most like you. So like the first example, I like action or I deal with problems in a systemic way, right there. Some of the questions are pretty similar. You know, the choices of one or two, some of them are completely different. That's by design to circle the one that is best correct to you. There's no right or wrong answer. And maybe neither of them really applies to you or both apply to you. Pick the one that is best representative of you. So there's 40 questions. And this is kind of the tricky part is going through and circling which ones you, you did. There's kind of a lot of page turning back and forth to add up to get to your 40 points. So again, we have these four separate communication styles in this test, action, process, people, and idea. We'll go through what each of those means briefly, but you can see that in order to figure out what best you are, you add up how many questions you answered with those action words from the previous sentences. So you go through, you add up, you know, in this example, we have the action was 11, the process was 15, uh, people five, idea nine. That's actually pretty similar to what my personal communication style is, right? So I'm a process person with some pretty high action in there as well. So we can see that if you kind of process it out, this or diagram it out, this is what it can kind of look like. So just a, a little better visual, you know, you're leaning towards process with some decent action and idea. And again, in this example, least for the people person. So again, this is pretty accurate for what I personally am, and there's no right or wrong to whatever type you are, but the point of this exercise is to determine which style of communication you most use by default 
and also better understand what your employees are, right? Maybe your employee is a very much a people person and they process what you say differently from an action person. So that's the key differences that we're trying to get across here. So we'll go through what each of these four types kind of mean. So starting with action people. So again, hopefully some of you filled out this and know which, which one you lean towards, or hopefully you'll do this after this call. Again, it's only about a 10 minute job to figure out which communication style you most use. So action people, right? They're pretty direct. They're also pretty impatient. You know, they're pretty decisive, quick, energetic, and they tend to challenge others. So they like to discuss results, objectives, responsibilities, moving ahead. You know, what is our next step? Those are action people. But there's also some cons with that, right? If you come across as direct and impatient, you can really come across as unemotional and non-caring, right? So, you know, if we're like, all right, we're going to move forward, do this, this, this step. You know, you might leave someone behind or have people feel like they are not listened to. So again, there's pros and cons with each of these. Again, when you're talking with an action person, you know, focus on the results. You know, if we do this step, this is the end result, right? Some visual aids might help in the explanation process, you know, and be brief and emphasize the practicality with, you know, like we recommend this as our next step, okay? The next one here is a process, and I lean heavily towards this process communication style. So again, they can come across as unemotional, cautious, a little more patient. You know, the, the action was not patient, very logical. They like to think through things, a lot of analysis. They like to talk about facts, you know, trying out different things, thinking through, oh, if we do this, this, this might happen. You know, they like a lot of analysis, proof, testing, observations. So they, they can get a little bit analysis by paralysis, where they, they think too much about things and don't necessarily, the end result, or actually think on what we should do moving forward. They keep thinking about what could happen without actually doing anything. So that's one of the negatives of these, the process people, and how they're kind of opposite in that regards from the action people. So again, so when you're talking with a process person, you know, provide the alternatives and facts. You know, be precise, organize it in a logical manner, logical order, you know, include options with pros and cons. You know, the process people like to think on pros and cons and do not rush the process oriented person. They spend a lot of time thinking through things before they come up with the final decision. And again, especially compared with an action person, a little bit slower. So again, how they differ. The next one here is a people person. So I think we kind of know what a people person is, right? They're a little more spontaneous, you know, emotional, not in a bad way, but they, they think what others are going to how others are impacted more so than what an action or a process person is going to do. They're going to be a little bit more sensitive and they're thinking through things and how they come across speaking, All right? So they talk, like talking about people, you know, they like talking about motivation, you know, what makes people, you know, click. Teamwork, they're big teamwork people. We're like, oh, let's do this together. You know, they may like discussing feelings and beliefs and values more so than the action or process people, right? The action people probably don't care how this is gonna impact random Joe Blow, right? This, they wanna get this step done. So again, when talking with the people person, you know, allow for small talk, they really appreciate that. Stress the relationship, you know, between your proposal and the people who are impacted. Show how this idea has worked well in the past, you know, how it's impacted certain groups of people involved, indicate support and uh, from well-respected people. Okay, so again, they like building relationships. So again, they might come across a little bit slower in some of their analysis, right? Because they wanna see how different people are impacted 
more so than an action person would even think about. So again, a little bit more different, probably a little bit more talkative, right? They like having these conversations, maybe not all relevant about what you're here to discuss. And then the last one we have to discuss here of the four are idea people. Okay, so they're going to be imaginative, you know, maybe difficult to understand because they have a lot of ideas and not all of them are going to be fine tuned finalized ideas, but they're throwing these ideas out there. So sometimes they can again bring too many ideas and this may be confusing to the group or having difficulty picking which of their ideas is the best one moving forward. So we want to, again, think about that. They can be unrealistic, right? Not all ideas are, are the next iPhone out there, right? Not every idea is a good idea. Full of ideas, imaginative again. They like thinking of talking about concepts, innovation, what's the new thing out there? What's the new trend? Interdependence, opportunities, improving things. You know, how can we make this thing better? What is a potential alternative? Those are some of the things they like to talk about. Um, idea people need to discuss and vet out possibilities, right? They maybe go out on a tangent. You know, you want to stress the importance and the uniqueness of an idea. Stress key concepts, okay? Allow enough time for discussion. So kind of similar to a process person, but the process people, uh, communication style, they're going to Think about the ideas that these idea people are going to create. So again, they're all a little bit different. And you probably know working through your relationships with employees and, and family, how different, different family members align in different communication styles that we just discussed. So the point of this exercise is to understand where you're coming from. You know, maybe you're an idea and a process person. And your employee is very much a people person who enjoys teamwork and how everybody benefits. And, and your process side of things, you know, don't always stand in line with that. So we just want to highlight understanding what your employees are and where you're coming from and how those can both align and not align. And maybe if you're explaining something and they keep asking how this is helpful to the group, it's not that they don't understand, it's just that the people person in them likes to have everybody supported. So just because they don't always comprehend what you're saying right away might be their communication styles and how they understand what you're telling them. So moving on from that a little bit more in communication, we have this quick comic, right? And this is obviously a, a comic and a joke, but there's some truth to it. You know, with this unspoken communication with girls, right? We have all these different arrows when they simply say hello to each other. You know, it's, it's maybe hard to read all the lines, but, you know, looking at what they're wearing, you know, their shoes, their hair, their clothing, things like that. And with the guys, you know, it's just the one line simply saying hello. So again, this kind of funny joke from the us moving along. You know, male-female communication can have opposite opinions. We can read the different highlights on the slide here. You know, male-male communication might be a little bit, you know, tempers flaring. One might ignore the other one a little bit more. And then, then that male-female, you know, the female can feel that she's not always being heard. So things we like to bring up. Again, female, female, sometimes they can become too personal. They kind of beat around the bush, not near as direct as a male communication tends to be. And these are also just, uh, these aren't relevant to every woman on the planet, right? We want to highlight these are just in general ideas that research has shown. Okay, a couple more things here. As people age, you know, as the, the, the different generations communicate different. So we're not going to go in great detail, but just that you're aware of this. You know, talking with your grandpa, talking with your children, they have different communication styles. And that's simply, you know, key elements in their childhood and growing up and the, the, the generation that they're in. 
And the years on the screen here, they're all a little bit blurry. You know, some people say millennials end in 95, some say 2000. So these aren't set in stone dates, but roughly the, how they align. And the last thing here about communication is just simply extroverts and introverts. Okay, so with the extrovert, being in a group gives them energy, drives them, right? They like being in a group with other people. Introverts, being in a group can drain them of energy. So we want to highlight, if you're an introvert, that doesn't mean you're a bad communicator. It just simply means being in a group communicating with others takes more energy than an extrovert who maybe they live for, you know, the party crowd, not a party crowd, but just being in a crowd communicating with others. So the question is here, do you feel drained or anxious when alone, right? Versus the introvert, they probably be, enjoy being alone more so than the extrovert, who are maybe more energized around people. Okay, so again, we killed the first 40 minutes on communication. I'll wrap this up quickly here on leadership, and Amber has some talks here at the end. What makes a leader? We have a very similar word cloud to the communication word cloud we had at the beginning. There's lots of different words, right? You know, attitude, motivation, manager, power, appreciation, responsibility, right? These different leaders have different verbs, adjectives associated with them, right? We have that little stack of books, intelligent, honest, creative, confident, driven, courageous, right? They're all good adjectives. And this quick activity, we won't spend a lot of time on here, but here's some different leaders from around the world, right? We have some sports leaders, some business leaders, some presidents, some religious Catholic leaders. You know, we have the lots of different leaders, right? What kind of leader do you want to be? We're not going to spend a lot of time right now discussing that, but I want you to think on it. Right? The point of this slide is there's lots of different leaders around the world. Some we might like, some we might not, some we might not like, but what kind of leader do you want to be? Who do you want to strive to be like? So then the next thought is, what do you need to do to become that kind of leader? What do you need to do to be more like that person? So just, just think on that as we kind of wrap up this talk today. It's now more so on the, the farm side of things, you know, from being an operations manager to a leader. That's a difficult transition to make. So a lot of times in farming, you know, you grew up, you, you know, you're, you were, you know, the, the hands-on person. You became good at it. You expanded your operation. You know, you were a manager milking the cows, for an example, and now as you've been successful, you expand your, your farm, you hire more labor, you now are a leader. But this transition is going to be at least as difficult, you know, as a challenge from a worker to operations manager. So the point of this is moving up the corporate ladder on the farm from, you know, hands-on farmer to more of, a more of a leader and an employee manager is a difficult transition. And we do know that people struggle with it. And there's nothing wrong with that. We just want to highlight ways to better that. So management. Management is efficiency in climbing the ladder. Okay. So milking cows, you know, in the most efficient time frame, right? You know, we want to get you know, 50 cows milked per hour. We want to get 100 cows milked per hour, right? These efficiency things, that's the management side of things. Growing crops, we want to get the most bushels per acre, you know, with a lower amount of inputs. That's the management side of things. But the leadership side of things here is determining whether the ladder is leaning against the right wall. You know, so are we milking these cows very quickly? But we also want to make sure that we're milking the cows properly and milking the right amount of cows, right? Maybe it's really efficient. We can get 
you know, two cows milked an hour in, in two minutes, but that's not a very sufficient way to maintain the business. So leadership is a little bit more of an overall approach, making sure that we're doing the proper things on the farm to keep it sustainable. So some key points here, you know, leadership is needed and valued throughout the organization. Informal leadership is more powerful than formal leadership. So I know we were te teaching a similar class to this years before, and the one guy stood up and said, after walking through some of these things, he realized that his, you know, his, his one employee manager was more well-respected than him as an owner. So just another title doesn't mean you have proper leadership. So this informal leadership is more powerful than formal leadership. Having the employees willing and able to ask you questions about what they should do, what's their next step, is the informal leadership versus just going up to someone else who maybe they respect, has a better understanding, a better thought process of what is going on. Great farms and businesses, you know, they require both management and leadership. Leadership can be learned. Okay, so with that, I'm going to have Amber talk about this next thing, but very similar to that communication styles that we talked about 10 minutes before. Great. Thanks, Nathan. So we are going to discuss six different types of leadership styles. You'll see that I stuck in the chat both a PDF version and then the link to the website. And this is a questionnaire that you can use to help figure out which one of these leadership styles might apply to you. As we're talking through them though, I'm sure that some of these will resonate with you. For some folks, they have one leadership style that really resonates with them. For others, it might be two or three. But a big thing I wanna point out before we dive into these, no leadership style is necessarily bad. All of these have a place that they are effective and that they are very much needed. On top of that, these are our preferred styles. So this is what we tend to like to do, but we may be able to use all of these throughout our lifetime. So just note that we aren't necessarily pigeonholing ourselves into, I am an authoritative leader, that is who I am, but I tend to most fall onto authoritative leadership, and that is Amber's preference. So we will dive on in, if you haven't done the questionnaire would recommend afterwards go back and also feel free to share that and the communication one with employees if you find them valuable. So the first one we're going to dive into is coercive leadership. Nathan, can I have you advance the slide? Thank you so much. And as you can see from here, it's this do it or else. Expectation of immediate compliance, very little to no input, influence with discipline. So this might sound scary, but it very much has a time and a place. Coercive leadership on your farm might be when it comes to safety. We know that coercive leaders have increased worker safety, and they also have increased employee following the rules. Right? They're more likely to have employees follow the rules because this really is about, I'm going to say it and you need to follow my instructions. So there is definitely a time and a place for this. A famous coercive leader would be Winston Churchill. Think about the stress that he faced going into decisions surrounding war. He had to be a coercive leader. And you might find this on your farm when it comes to farm safety, like we said grain bin safety, when it comes to how you handle and treat animals, there may be no room to deviate from those rules. We need to follow the grain safety rules because if we don't, it could be a matter of life or death. So coercive leadership, sometimes also called commanding leadership, is best for crisis situations, for unresponsive members, and for when we really need safety to be key. Next slide authoritative leadership. This is what I am. It also sometimes is called visionary leadership. And this is fair but firm. Provides clear instructions, solicits some input, and carefully monitors behavior. So some famous authoritative leaders, JFK, Bill Gates, 
Martin Luther King Jr. And where we see authoritative leadership really come into play is when new directions are needed. That is where this is the best leadership style to use. Provides a lot of clarity, can help you to form that shared vision, and it can also help people get in line with heading on that vision and that path. Next slide. Affiliative leadership. This is the good buddy. Feels people come first and tasks come second. These leaders really like to create harmony. They care about people. They want to be liked. Uh, they tend to provide little direction. So if you are a fan of the TV show, The Office, this is Michael Scott, right? He wants to be liked by his employees. Other famous leaders that we see that are affiliative leaders include the Dalai Lama and Joe Torres, who is a very famous coach for the New York Giants, who used to give positive feedback about his team, no matter whether they won and lost in the columns of newspapers every single game. And where affiliative leadership can really come in is when we're mending rifts, when we're handling stress. Farm families, we often have family members that are involved. So sometimes making sure that we take care of those emotions and keep that family harmony, right? Because we're facing this dual role of we are a family, but we're also a business. Next slide. Democratic leadership, the let's vote. So participatory style, they want to elicit feedback from their followers, use that feedback to make decisions. They might hold many meetings. They don't like disciplining employees and they feel that supervision or very detailed instructions are not necessary. So where this tends to work best is when we need to get group buy-in. When there's no clear way forward and we wanna make sure that everyone has the option to voice their opinion. So we also, a pro of this is that you're leveraging the expertise of those that are in the room. Leveraging the expertise and the opinions of your employees, your coworkers, perhaps other family members. But sometimes this can cause indecisiveness. It can be hard to make a decision. And so some famous leaders that are democratic, Eisenhower and I'm looking at my cheat sheet here, Mandela. Next slide, please. And we had a question in the chat. Can you broadly generalize leadership types by gender, family, business, professions, management? I would say that in terms of leadership types, there is no necessarily one that fits in for certain family businesses, certain professions. Some professions may tend to fall closer to or choose one over the other, but you can see in any profession in any farm that these may fall throughout many different employees and they might be exhibited in different ways. So there's no one necessary leadership style that we most often see on a farm. And you might be thinking as we're going through these, oh, yep, that leadership style definitely has to be Bill, who is one of my farm hands that I've had for 20 years. This one is, hopefully that helps answer that question. Case setting leadership, follow me leadership. So they like to perform technical activities, they have very high standards for themselves and they expect others to do the same. So they are setting the example of what it means to thrive and be successful in this business. And they expect employees to meet that bar or exceed that bar. And if they don't, sometimes they will take away responsibilities from those employees. Some downsides of this, that interpersonal relationship the group harmony isn't necessarily as much a concern for pace setting leaders. So what is this best for? This is best for when you need a motivated, competent, and independent team. So if on your farm, you need to know that an employee can fully handle the dairy herd and you are going to handle the crop, this is where pace setting leadership might work well. And some famous pace setting leaders. The prime example here that most people use is a man called Jack Welsh, who led General um, Electric Company. Next slide. And last but not least, our coaching leadership style. This is the developer, the delegator. They develop their employees. They have high standards of performance and they allow flexibility in setting goals and completing tasks. So when we think about our coaching leaders, 
They connect personal dreams with their organization dreams. So they encourage employees to feel like they are a part and of the company and they really build on their abilities and they build on employee loyalty. But if it's done poorly, it can look like micromanaging. Where this leadership style tends to work best is building long-term capabilities of your employees. And some famous coaching leaders, Gandhi and Steve Jobs. Next slide. So we've pretty quickly here touched on the six different types of leadership. And if you filled out that leadership questionnaire, you will see that it says A through F and they just happen to follow the exact order that we talked about. So A is our coercive, which is our protect and ensure safety. B is our authoritative, train, chalk the field, correct. C is our affiliative, build trust, show that you care, really focus on group harmony. D, democratic, involve and empower, eliciting group input to make those decisions. E is our pace setting, lead the way, be the role model, expect them to meet that bar or exceed it. And then F is our coaching, teaching, encouraging, and developing the skills of our employees. So as we're going through these, one or maybe more of these resonated with you. There is no right or wrong leadership style. And you may find that all of these apply to you in different situations and different points in times. But knowing these can help us to understand what style we're using, what situations these might be best for, and also thinking back to what Nathan had said earlier. How do these play out with our informal leaders? And how are we encouraging our employees to lead from any position? And what might their styles look like? Next slide. So, yep, this just goes back to there will be differences in communication and ideas due to preferences, but there is no wrong or right here. These just tend to be what we fall to. These are our preferences. We may prefer one leadership style. We may prefer one communication style. That doesn't mean that we can't use others. And that doesn't mean that there won't come times when we need to use others. That just tends to be the one that we most heavily rely on. Yeah, that was a great summary, Amber. And we just, we're kind of at the end of our time here. But we just want to highlight again, you know, depending on your preference, you know, these comments might be viewed differently by others. Okay, so this is kind of a wrap up slide here. Be willing to engage in a positive communication with your employees. You know, take the chance, you know, in, in positive communication. Include everyone appropriate in the discussions about the farm. So again, keeping everyone involved from the get-go who is relevant with those decision-making, right? Consider, consider inviting employees to work the front lines. You know, maybe bring some of your milk milkers into some of the parlor update conversations or things like that, you know, because it changes their work. They do have an impact in the decision that you made. So having them you know, at the front of the discussion, you know, you might change your ideas. You might change your viewpoints a little bit with their input. Be respectful, listen to everyone's comments. Be mindful, again, of these gender, generation, personal preferences, the cultural differences. You know, everyone has a different viewpoint. Again, embrace those differences, you know, as being beneficial. And then treat your employees, you know, as a valued team member. So again, that's a good wrap up. So just, you know, treat everyone with respect is a pretty good darn place to start.